Love Talk Radio. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! They were. That's why we took the damn field. You want to crown them? They crown their ass. But they are who we thought they were. And we let them off the hook. I mean, you can take a knee and try a 56-yard field goal. This is not Detroit, man. This is the Super Bowl. It is more about them than it is about the team. Cannot play with them. Cannot win with them. Cannot coach with them. Can't do it. I want winners. What's up, Ron? Playoffs? Don't talk about <laughs> playoffs. You kidding me? I just hope we can win a game. <laughs> You need to be more like a dog. Do it. We don't need a bunch of cats in here. Meow, meow. Be a dog. We don't need no meows. We don't need no cats. We need more dogs. They just lost Rondo. I don't know what we're doing anything. And thank you for joining me. He is questionably parked near Venice Beach. We're live. Shirts versus skins with Alistair Conrad. Top of the morning, everybody. Good morning, indeed. Welcome to Shirts v. Skins. I'm Alistair Conrath. Uh, happy Sunday fun day, everybody. Those of you already in Facebook Live, uh, top of the morning, Jane, Lonell, the rest of you, the millions listening around the world, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm stoked. I, I, you're with me for the next about 43 minutes or so. Uh, uh, it's been a year since he's been on, but I'm excited because I've got Scott Wright, president and CEO of DraftCountdown.com, one of the best dra- NFL draft sites in the world. He's going to be joining just in a couple minutes. Um, it, very, very uh, uh, fun time. He's Generally, it's a yearly thing. Uh, he'll come on in and uh, you know chat about the NFL draft, and this one's a good one. It's a good one. Uh, you know, we'll chat up your Vikings. Uh, if anybody wants to call in and uh, inquire about their football team, have at it. 213-943-3423. Um, uh, quickly before I get to Scott, though, um, the quick thing on the wild, uh, wild hockey, you know, it's unfortunate. This is, this is a, a good example of, uh, you know, momentum. I mentioned it last week on the show. You can have an awesome regular season. The Wild were literally the best team in hockey for about three months out of the season. Which, by the way, the season's way too long anyway. But for about three months out of the season, the Wild were arguably the best team, most points, blah, blah, blah. But something happened, and they lost their mojo. And that happens in sports. It's unfortunate, especially for Wild fans right now, because losing 4-1 in the first round to a hot blues team stings but it, look at that series and and look at Nashville and Chicago St. Louis was on an, on a high they had literally i think won 21 out of their last 24 the wild were not they had they had kind of fallen back a bit and so you know i mean it's all about how you're playing Come playoff time, Lonell is in the in Facebook Live right now. He just asked me about the Bulls and how they, how, you know, what he thinks they're gonna do. It's a perfect situation. All of a sudden, you're up 2-0 on the number one seed, Boston. Then you know, momentum is all on your side, and then all you lose Rajon Rondo, and, and you know, sure enough, they lost their home game to Boston. That's uh, exactly what Boston needed 
to get back in this thing. And so it, it is all about momentum. It's all it is. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the Wild, you know, uh, I don't need... Th th there's one thing that just... It doesn't matter about momentum or anything. You are always in control about how you... The effort that you give. And it, for whatever reason, the Wild just did not give the effort... In, in in numerous games in the first period, they are, they started off slow. The, every every game, the team who scored first won, and unfortunately, four out of the five was the Blues to score first, and then then so obviously you saw what happened. Um, so that's it. Anyway, it's a, it's all good. That's enough uh, hockey talk. I just wanted to touch base on that. Um, joining me now. Uh, like I said, uh, you know, opening the show, Scott Wright, CEO, president of DraftCountdown.com. Literally, if you want to go and check out any NFL draft uh, right up, that is literally just one of the best in the world for the player summaries. You got to go to DraftCountdown.com. Scott is just on top of it. He's been doing for doing this for so many years. I am honored to have him back on the show. He's a busy guy taking the time out. Scott, good morning. How are you, sir? I'm doing excellent. Thanks for having me. Hey, how many years is this uh, that you've been doing DraftCountdown.com? Uh, you know what? I started the site originally, obviously, on a much smaller scale, but in, in 1997, so this is 20 years, two decades. <laughs> oh, my. That's so, that, that, that is amazing. We're getting it's old. Crazy, right? We are getting old. That, I think that's all that means is we're, <laughs> we're kind of getting old. <laughs> I love it. Okay, well, I tell you what. Let's, uh, let's jump right on into it. You know, I'm looking... Number one, I looked at, you know, your player rankings, uh, you know, your, your last mock draft. All I'm getting out of this is that this draft seems to be one of the de the deepest in recent memory. Is, is, would you agree on that? Yeah, it's a really good draft, well above average. And there's certain positions that are lacking, and, and there's some that are stronger. But overall, it's a really good draft. And, and I'm kind of of the mind that there's always talent to be found, even in quote-unquote bad drafts. To me, those are even more exciting because then it's a challenge. Then you have to dig deeper, and it's a really real test. So I think any evaluator worth his salt would say there's always talent to be found. But uh, no, no question, this is a really good draft. And, and of course, the, the discussion all starts with the quarterback. Any NFL draft, I, I kind of compare it to when you're putting together a puzzle. You put the border, you do the or the the borders first, and then you kind of fill in the interior. Well. With the NFL draft, if you know where the quarterbacks are, they're kind of the edges. You can once you have those, you can kind of fill in the rest. But figuring out where those quarterbacks are going to land is kind of the the key to unlocking uh, what's going to happen. And and that's still very very much up in the air with less than a week to go. So okay, so with that said, you know you look at last year and uh, Jared Goff goes uh, one, Carson Wentz goes two. But leading up to the draft. There was a lot of talk about uh, them basically not being good enough to hold down the top of the draft, and they're going to be somewhere littered in, littered in maybe like a you know the 2013 draft with EJ Manuel uh, and Geno Smith and so forth uh, quarterbacks that just weren't worthy of that top pick. This year we kind of have a same situation with Mitchell Trubisky and uh, Deshaun Watson and so forth. But the closer we get to draft day, is there any chance that Cleveland or Chicago or the Jets actually make a move as, as, for a quarterback, you know, and kind of fool everybody? And I do think Mitchell Trubisky from North Carolina is the favorite to be the first quarterback off the board somewhere in the 2-12 to 12 range. and. And what we've seen recently, and I call this silly season, teams are kind of chumming the waters trying to uh, trade, to bring in trade offers. And, uh, of course, it's quarterbacks that, that bring those big trades. We saw last year the top two picks in the, were, in the draft were traded with teams wanting to come up for a quarterback. So uh, it, it's hard to tell sometimes whether this interest in Trubisky in the top ten overall is legitimate or whether they're just trying to elicit a trade offer. I think it's a little bit more towards the latter, but, but teams will do desperate, crazy things when it comes to the quarterback position. And uh, Trubisky, I have a similar grade on him, actually a little lower grade than I did on Blake Bortles when he was coming out. Now, Bortles wound up going number three overall, but I thought he was more of a late first-round pick. And uh, the problem with this quarterback class is 
there are a lot of options, which is a good thing. Uh, unlike a couple years ago where you had Jameis Winston went number one, Marcus Mariota went number two, and then it just absolutely fell off a cliff. And if you needed a quarterback that year, you are out of luck. This year, it reminds me of 2014 where there are a lot of options, but they all have potentially fatal flaws as well. And, and there really wasn't a consensus in 2014. That was the year that we had Bortles, Johnny Manziel, Teddy Bridgewater, Derek Carr, Jimmy Garoppolo, A.J. McCarron, Tom Savage. You had all of these interesting guys, uh, and it winds up that the best of the bunch coming off the board in the second round was Derek Carr to this point. So I think we could see a similar thing this year where the best quarterback from this class maybe gets selected in the second round. But I think the options for Trubisky, San Francisco at two, uh, I think the Jets at six, the Bills at ten, the Browns at 12. I think one of those four teams is where Trubisky ultimately lands up. But, but then where does the next run start? Because based on the current draft order, I don't know that we're going to see another quarterback in the first round. Now, I do think somebody will trade back in to take one of these signal callers, but everyone points to the Houston Texans at 25. I don't know that they're ready to start over with a, a rookie quarterback. I think they feel they're ready to compete now. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs at 27. Uh, I, I would be looking for an heir apparent to Alex Smith, but I think that organization uh, likes him. I don't know that they see a replacement as a first-round priority. So um, if I'm a quarterback and, and I'm still on the board after the number 12 overall pick, I'm probably a little worried because then at that point your fate's going to be dependent upon trades, which is a, um, a, a very risky proposition. So uh, seeing what order the, these quarterbacks come off the board is going to be the storyline, and I think it's going to be Trubisky first, and then I think it's Deshaun Watson from Clemson and Patrick Mahomes from Texas Tech duking it out to be that next and and even though we might not see a lot early we're going to see a run late round one early to mid round two i won't be surprised if we see four four quarterbacks come off the board in that 25 to 50 range so then uh, why uh, one uh, something that just boggles me and i just don't get it if there are teams out there who are looking for a quarterback you look at last year and what the the rams gave up to tennessee to select jared goff which I mean, it's just incredible to think. Uh, and then all of a, and then you have Garoppolo or Kurt Cousins, and 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 teams aren't willing to give up the same ransom for a, a person like Garoppolo, who's been in the Patriots system, who's uh, who's learned under Tom Brady. I, I just don't understand why are why are teams willing to give up so much for an unproven college kid versus a Jimmy Garoppolo. And I think I have a pretty good answer for that. And for a long time, I always said the most valuable thing in the NFL is a good starting quarterback. But I had to revise that a little bit in recent years because the most valuable commodity in the NFL is a good starting quarterback on a rookie contract because it just gives you so much flexibility to build that rest of the team around the player when you don't have 15 20 $25 million of your salary cap committed to one single player. I think that's the issue with Kirk Cousins and Jimmy Garoppolo. If it was just a matter of giving up, say, the number two pick for Kirk Cousins, the 49ers might do that. Or if it was just giving up the number 12 pick for Mitchell for uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, I think the Browns might do that. But it's not just giving up that premium draft pick and that cheap young starter. It's giving them a big contract extension. Kirk Cousins, you're going to have to give him $100, $125 million. Jimmy Garoppolo, you're going to have to give him probably north of what Brock Osweiler got last offseason, which was 75. So I think the money commitment, and, and that's the thing. None of these quarterbacks, there would be one thing if one of these guys was Andrew Luck, and it was a sure thing, but they're not. And so I think teams look at it and say, well, uh, yeah, I mean, we like this guy, but he's not a sure thing. And considering the monetary investment, and I don't blame them. I would rather have one of these young quarterbacks uh, then go out and make a huge, bold move for either Kirk Cousins and Jimmy Garoppolo, considering all of the the uh, other factors involved. Because uh, the other thing you have to keep in mind with this quarterback class is this year we don't have a consensus top ten signal caller. Some t some people might have one of these guys there, but but certainly no consensus. Next year it's going to be a lot better. We're going to have two, maybe three, legitimate top ten overall quarterbacks: and Sam Darnold from USC, Josh Rosen from UCLA. Uh, maybe Josh Allen from Wyoming. So you just wonder if teams are, are taking that into account because, let's face it, if the Cleveland Browns take Mitchell Trubisky in the top dozen picks this year, they're out of the quarterback race next year, for better or worse. If Trubisky falls flat on his face, they're going to have a really hard time using the top pick on a quarterback a year from now. So I just wonder if, especially the Browns, because they're 
their new regime is very forward thinking. You can see the way they've been stockpiling future assets. They've got three second round picks next year, and they've been keeping one eye on the future. And they basically punted on a quarterback position last year. I wonder if they might even do that again, knowing there's so much better options on the horizon rather than acting and reaching out of desperation. So I think that's the question some of these quarterback needy teams have to ask themselves at the top of the draft. And and, and I don't envy them. And and if it were me, if I were, for example, the Cleveland Browns, because they're the team everybody points to that needs a quarterback more than anybody, if I were them, I would take, certainly you take Miles Garrett from Texas A&M with the number one overall pick. He is an elite talent at a premium position. That's no-brainer. But then I take best player available at number 12, too, and then I target my quarterback at 33 because there's going to be one of these top four or five quarterbacks still on the board there, and I don't think there's a whole lot separating them. So uh, I would roll the dice because then even if it doesn't work out with whoever you took took at 33, you're still in the game for next year. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with, with, with the Cleveland Browns specifically, but just these quarterbacks in general, especially the teams that really need a quarterback because – you hear about maybe the Saints could take a quarterback in the top 50, maybe the Cardinals, but it's not like it's going to affect their their long-term outlook this year right away. Whereas, you know, the, the Browns, the 49ers, the Jets, the Bills, these teams have big decisions to make at that quarterback position. And uh, I think what they do in this draft, if they wait on quarterbacks, it's going to be an indictment of this signal caller class. And I just have a feeling these quarterbacks as a whole are going to fall a little further than expected. You know, I didn't, great analogy. Number one, number two, though, I, if I'm the Browns, I am looking like you said next year to the quarterbacks that are available. I, if I'm the Browns, I don't even. I, I mean, I might wait until I don't know the fourth round because I, I'm all I, the way they're set up. I don't feel confident with Trubisky or Deshaun Watson or, or Davis Webb or Mahomes and so forth. When you're looking at next year, I want as much talent as I can have to get Josh Rosen or Sam Darnold or, you know, X. And so for me, and you know, Cleveland without the quarterback isn't all of a sudden just going to, you know, turn it around and be 9-7 and seven this year. And so with that... I would just go ahead and and get a, a quarterback maybe in the fourth or fifth round, get as much talent with those. I think they have like six picks in the top, you know, in the two rounds or, or three rounds, something like that. Get as much talent as you can for the quarterback to come in next year because the one thing that I think is amazing that I, I don't think enough people paid attention to with Cleveland is what they did with the offensive line. I mean, obviously you had Joe Thomas, yeah. but I mean to get TJ. I think it was TJ Lang, and to get <clears throat> the the uh, Zeitler kid from Cincinnati, and the guy from uh, uh, the center, the settler from Green Bay. I mean, their their offensive line. Obviously, they they need to play together to see how they're going to be. But on paper, Cleveland just knocked it out of the park. And we saw last year with Oakland and Dallas how important offensive lines are and, quite honestly, with Minnesota and how important an offensive line is. Uh, so if I'm Cleveland, I, I'm doing the opposite of what you said in the sense of like a puzzle. I'm building from the inside and, and out and waiting until next year just because they're not going to all of a sudden, you know, contend for the playoffs this year, especially, you know, with a bunch of rookie guys that they draft. I just feel it's in their best interest, you know, to go ahead and, and stockpile. Get Garrett, get O.J. Howard if he's there, and then at 33 maybe get Humphrey if he's, you know, the, the corner from Bama if he's there. I doubt he'll be there. But you know what I'm saying, you know, maybe, you know, like a Tredavious White or something like that. I agree to a certain point, and, and uh, like I said, the number 33 is where I'd be taking a quarterback because I think where the Browns erred last year, and this is kind of what they did last year, they knew that they didn't have a very talented team, they didn't want to use a high draft pick on a quarterback, which I understand, and they waited until the end of the third round and they took Cody Kessler out of USC, who I thought projected as a career backup. I had him as a late-round pick, a lot of people did, and, and I think as a rookie he showed that he has the potential to develop into a solid backup in the NFL. Um, but but I think they erred in not taking somebody who had at least a little more 
potential. I would have rather seen the Browns take a Cardell Jones, who I was a fan of. And, and he had his question marks, too. There was a reason he was a third-round pick, but I think there was more upside there with him. And who knows, maybe if he had gotten the playing time that Cody Kessler got as a rookie, he would have shown something. So I think there's a fine line in this draft. You want to get somebody who legitimately has starting potential so if they do get an opportunity and and you expend though that playing time on them this year you know you're, you're getting some benefit out of it and one other thing i want to mention about this quarterback class and a phenomenon i think i kind of noticed is because of this top group of four or five quarterbacks that you're gonna to have to take in the top you know whether it's first round early mid second round because they all have question marks and because they're all so risky i think teams are kind of talking themselves into one of these second third tier guys um, because knowing that they have question marks too, but they're going to be a whole lot cheaper. And, and I think that's going to lead to uh, Nathan Peterman from Pittsburgh and a Joshua Dobbs from Tennessee getting pushed up maybe a round or even two rounds earlier than they, they probably should based on their college film. I have basically mid-round grades on them four fifth rounds, but I, I wouldn't be shocked to see one or even both of them go in the second or third round. And, um, and, and I don't think it's anybody necessarily saying, all oh, these guys have more talent than... Trubisky or Watson or Kaiser or Mahomes or even Davis Webb from Cal, who we haven't talked about, who's going to go in the top 50, but I think teams are looking at it, well, well, it, 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 we don't love any of these guys, let's make the lower investment and, and keep our options open, and I think that's what Peterman and Dobbs would be, so don't be surprised if I talked about the Houston Texans earlier, everybody's giving them a quarterback at number 25 overall in the first round, don't be surprised if they wait and take a Peterman in the second or third round instead. I, you know, to to piggyback on that, there's a part of me that, you know, also says just the, the, the same possibly could be true for the quarterback slipping, just because there's not a true number one and, and everybody has, you know, a, a mishap here and there. I, you know, there possibly could, have, you know, be teams that just say, ah, I don't know, and all of a sudden you have a Peterman who maybe slips to the fourth, which to me, uh, you know, I think that kid's legit. I, I I don't know what it is about the kid. I like his makeup. Bottom line, um, you know. But uh, to me, you might have somebody or some situation like that that all of a sudden, you know, some of these kids are slipping just because nobody is one hundred percent in love with these guys. Um, so it's a, that. Oh, well, and I the, talked about that twenty fourteen class. Yeah, oh, go sorry, ahead. I just want to mention I talked about that twenty fourteen class. And there were guys in that class that everyone thought were going to go way higher. That slid. Uh, at one point, Tom Savage was being talked about. Maybe he goes in the first round. He fell to the fourth round. A.J. McCarron, at one point, I, I didn't ever think he was going to be a first-round pick, but he thought he did at one point, and he wound up falling to the fifth round. Zach Mettenberger fell to the sixth round. So so we could see that. Some of these quarterbacks that, that people are talking about, and the one that kind of stands out to me is Joshua Dobbs. Some of that hype is, just seems manufactured to me, and, he is a, a good physical specimen, a really impressive kid. This guy's I believe he's literally a rocket scientist. He's yeah. extremely smart and yep. <laughs> all those intangibles you want, but, but boy, the, the, the sum is not – those parts do not equal up to a great player on the field, at least not yet. He's more of a, of a developmental guy. So, um, you know, I, I just wonder if when push comes to shove, he's somebody who's really going to take him as early as been rumored second or third round or if he's going to be available in that fourth, fifth round where he, he probably belongs. You know, first off, you're listening to Shirts v. Skins. With me is Scott Wright, uh, President and CEO of DraftCountdown.com. Um, what do you think? It I look back at the last five drafts, and it, literally in the first round, there's about half the guys who make it, half that don't. What do you attribute guys that make it to? Is it lo- location, system? What do you think it is that, that a guy, you know, catches on versus the ones who fall off? Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of people talk about the bust rate in the first round, and, and it's risky. It's, you know, it's 50-50, like you said, and it's kind of similar to baseball, where if you get a hit three out of every ten times, you're a Hall of Famer. You have to have realistic, realistic expectations. So uh, why do guys bust in the first round? And I think every player, there's a different answer. I don't think there's one catch-all that covers everything. And a lot of times when it comes to the quarterbacks, I think it's a situation. Uh, because anybody that goes in the first round, they've been researched, checked, they have the talent. That's not a question. A lot of times it comes down to either they go into a poor situation, especially when it comes to the quarterback. I always say nothing will ruin a young quarterback faster than playing them before they're ready, not giving them weapons to throw to, 
especially not protecting them if they get hit too often early in their career. They develop bad habits. So I think you see a lot of that when it comes to the quarterbacks. And then the other positions, I, I think it comes down to being tangible. You can't measure the heart, the desire, especially you can't measure uh, how they're, how these personalities and then these lives are going to be affected when you add millions of dollars to the equation. So uh, I don't think there is one catch-all that I could say, put my finger on it, that this is the reason. But especially when it comes to the quarterbacks, cause those are the high-profile busts. Um, I think it comes down to the situation. And, and everybody talks about, you know, I, I'm not going to take a quarterback in the first round. It's too risky. i got a 50-50 shot. I'm going to wait till the fourth round, and I'm going to find the next Dak Prescott. Or I'm going to wait till the sixth round and find the next Tom Brady. The reason everybody remembers these Tom Brady's, these Dak Prescott's, these Joe Montana's is because they're the aberration. If you think it's tough to find a start, good starting quarterback in the first round, try to find one beyond the first round. Uh, I did want to study it. It might have changed a little bit in the last five years or so, but... Uh, about a half decade ago, your chances of finding a, a, a truly good starting quarterback beyond the first round was somewhere percentage-wise in the single digits. So, um, and at the end of the day, even though it's risky, you got to keep swinging because until you find the quarterback, nothing else is going to matter. Well, and I do believe a lot of it is between the ears. You know, I, I've, I've said it for years in the sense that, you know, in little league, in high school, you know, if you're good. You're just, uh, you're better than everybody else. And then you get to college, and, you know, the best, uh, the always rise to the top. But once you get to the NFL, everybody, you know, when it comes to a linebacker, everybody's 6'3", 250. They all run a 4'5". And, uh, and at every position, you know, it's the elite. And so not only is there a testosterone, you know, um, um, part to it where everybody is just so superior and alpha dog, I think that also blends into why people don't make it, though, in in all rounds, but just on you know in first round because you are so highly touted your whole life, and then all of a sudden you get to a squad where everybody is the alpha dog and everybody is the man, and yep. so some people just don't have that extra that extra gear that extra level of mindset to actually succeed i i do believe that's a lot to it i i also believe it's the system you know i mean if, i thought you were going to say nothing ruins a young quarterback quite like cleveland <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> that too well, they just break all the rules what i think of is Bla blaine gabbert the, the jaguars really broke every rule in the book when it comes to blaine gabbert and maybe he wouldn't have made it anyways although he's still kicking around the league i mean there there's been greater failures and greater busts when it comes to quarterbacks but uh the biggest thing though is protection it, it, as long as i can yeah. protect my young quarterback i want to play him because there's nothing that's going to substitute those those live bullets on the field the speed of the game so as long as i can protect my young quarterback i want to play him and and i think cleveland's done it like going back to cleveland you talked about the job they've done on the offensive line this year i think they did the right approach uh, and so if they did take a quarterback this year i think they're a lot more well prepared uh, this year than they would have been a year ago for that young quarterback to step in and, uh, uh, and and have a chance to succeed at least. Well, and I think there's two situations that uh, personify the offensive line aspect. And obviously you mentioned Blaine Gabbard. I mean, he got thrown to the Wolves. But David Carr, back in the day for Houston, got thrown to the Wolves too and, and, yep. and shattered what, was, what could have been probably – a promising career but then on the flip side to it you got somebody like Mark Sanchez who you know gets drafted by the Jets and has a superior offensive line in the first two years they go to the AFC championship game so it I I think more and more and I, I think this is just common knowledge but I think more and more people are really really getting on board the, especially you know with what we see Cleveland doing uh, when it comes down to the offensive line, and for that fact, the defensive line too, because I've said it 1,000 times, football really is simple. All, if you can block, you're, you're winning the game. If you can stop the run, you're winning the game. I mean, it really is one in the trenches, and a lot of people, a lot of GMs get really sidetracked into the shiny toys. Rick Spielman for the Vikings could, you know, arguably could get, you know, could be put into that box uh, and so uh, I just believe offensive line is everything and uh, with the Cleveland the way they're set right now yeah you know I mean you could throw a, a raw quarterback in there and just have you know I don't, just don't think they have the running game though to, to you know that Sanchez did at the Jets or the defense quite honestly because that Jet defense was 
really, really good. Uh, Sanchez was in a really good situation, but I still believe that offensive line is, is uh, you know, pretty much everything. Um, what it, every year, it seems as though, um, you know, somebody always blows their millions of dollars. And last year, it was Laramie Tunsil uh, with the whole uh, bong mask sucking down the pot. And this year, it seems like it might be Reuben Foster, uh, the linebacker from Alabama. It, it, everybody seems to put too much attention onto things that, in my opinion, don't really matter too much. Obviously, he had a, a situation at the combine, you know, where he had an altercation. He also failed a drug test. Um, what is uh, what is Reuben Foster going to expect come Thursday? Well, and, and I've been saying all along that I thought, even before this, this uh, report about, the, not even a report, he admitted himself, he wanted to get ahead of the story, I guess, that, that he uh, it failed his drug test in the scouting combine. Just for clarity's sake, supposedly um, what it was, was he got flagged for a diluted sample, which is the same outcome. They still count that as a failed test. And a lot of times what guys will do is they'll try to flush out their system by uh, uh, overly hydrating. So, so he got popped for a failed test, and then he had also got sent home from the combine before he got to work out or anything because he got in an altercation with the hospital worker, a verbal altercation with the hospital worker, because he was impatient, which is a, you know, it's just not, not a good look. But ultimately, I don't know if those reasons by themselves are going to lead to his drop. I think there's other concerns with him. First of all, he's not healthy yet. Like a lot of these Alabama prospects, they come out of that program pretty beat up, because they realize, I can't sit out of practice, because I have two five-star recruits waiting behind me to take my job. So, a lot of times, Bama prospects come out as, as damaged goods to a certain degree, and, and he's got some shoulder issues that he's still not recovered from right now, so he's still not healthy. So he's got character issues, he's got health issues, and then just as a player, he's an off-the-ball linebacker who doesn't rush the passer, and those guys tend to slip in the draft. And there are exceptions, Patrick Willis, Luke Keekley, uh, but, but they're somewhat rare, and I don't put Foster quite in their category as a talent, and he didn't have, they didn't have those other questions coming out. So in my last mock draft, I think it was almost a month ago, I had Foster going number 32 to the Saints, and that was before this, this drug test report. So I still think he probably goes in the first round. I won't be shocked if he fell in the first round, but I think his range is going to be somewhere maybe 16 to 32. I think the Ravens might be his best-case scenario, and, and Ozzie Newsom has connections to that Alabama program, being a former Crimson Tide player himself. So he'll get the inside scoop, and be able to make a determination if he feels comfortable. And if he is going to go really early, they'll keep on this. Keep an eye on the Bengals at number nine. They're a team that has never shied away from guys with character concerns. But uh, but no question. I mean, Ruben Foster, he's a really good football player. But if I were to pick one guy that is going to fall a lot further than people expect, uh, I think it's going to be him. Uh, and, and and it's not just because of the, the, the reasons that are in the headlines now. A lot more is going to go into it. Well, and uh, and for the headline things anyway, a lot of people want to say, well, Warren Sapp, you know, did, did did pretty well, and Randy Moss did pretty well, but there's also, you know, probably more situations that we don't hear about of players that don't do well and are, you know, our head cases. I mean, we hear about it quite honestly all the time. Uh, you know, NFL players, NBA players, and so forth. They're not, well, aside from Joshua Dobbs, <laughs> they're not rocket scientists. Uh, and so, you know, they are they are bound to get in trouble here and there. Um, so, and, and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. You know, Bengals, Bengals fans always give me uh, the business for bringing that up. And, and I'm not even necessarily saying it's a bad thing because there's countless examples where it worked out well for them. Look at Jeremy Hill turned into a good player. Michael Johnson turned into a good player. Vontez Berfick, despite his issues, he's a good player. So... There are plenty of examples. They've gotten a lot of good years out of Pac-Man Jones, but there are other examples, too, where it kind of blew up in their faces. So, you know, it's it, it, it's risky, but I, I, one thing I've learned from covering the draft for 20 years is that the more talent you have, the more teams are willing to overlook. And I think we're going to see that again with Joe Mixon this year, the running back from Oklahoma, who, if he didn't have that ugly off-the-field incident, he'd be running back two in this draft and probably a top 12 to 15 overall pick. I don't think anybody's going to take him in the first round, but I think he goes on day two or day three. Well, I love that you bring him up. On day two, round two or round three. I, I do I do appreciate the fact that you bring him up because as I looked at your latest mock draft, and uh, real quick, when is uh, when do you put out your final mock draft? Yeah, I'm working on my final rankings this weekend. They'll be up at the beginning of the week, and then my final mock draft will be up Thursday, uh, the day of the draft. All right, beautiful. And so I was watching... 
I was looking at it last night, uh, your latest mock draft, which was put out April 3rd, uh, and uh, much to my surprise, and, you know, I just, and we're going to talk Vikings here, because there's a lot of people on Facebook Live, uh, you know, who are obviously interested. I already have a question uh, about Spielman, uh, which I'll get to after this, but, you know, I, we just talked about character, and uh, yes, Joe Mixon, uh, running back, Oklahoma, the guy is uh, all-world talent and a three-down back, which is all, extremely important this day and age in the NFL. But obviously he yep. knocked a, a girl and broke her nose or broke her face, whatever the case is. Not positive, but in your latest mock draft, you have Joe Mixon in round two going to the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, with the concerns at offensive guard and defensive tackle, what is it about Mixon that makes you bypass more pressing needs uh, to go after him? Well, there's no player the Vikings could pick in round two with their top pick in this draft that would have more impact for them than Joe Mixon. Uh, because they do still need some offensive line help, but especially, but they need it on the interior. They, they address the, the edges with Riley Reef and uh, Mike Remmers. So they need a guard. That, that's one of the stronger positions in this draft. You're going to be able to get a guard not only in round two, but round three, round four, even well into round five. I think you can get a starting caliber guard. So, um, you know, and I don't know that the Vikings would take Joe Mixon, but it would make some sense. I don't know that Latavius Murray is the long-term answer. And, and it just comes down to the public relations with Joe Mixon, and that's the type of decision that everybody in the organization is going to have to be involved. It's not just Mitch Spielman or, or the coaches or the scouts that are making the decision. You're talking to the public relations department. You're talking to the ownership. So there's a lot of moving parts with Joe Mixon, which uh, leaves his status more up in the air because he has fewer options. There's a lot of teams that wouldn't take him if he was on the board in the seventh round. But uh, but there's no denying that sheer talent. And, uh, and you know, from the Vikings' perspective, it, it, it's, I, I don't want to – I was going to make an off-color joke about at least him. Uh, at least he hits adults as opposed to their previous running back who liked to, uh, to beat up on children. But you know, it's, it's true. You know, I mean, the Vikings—they've overlooked some things too, just like yeah. everybody else. You yeah. know, and uh, I think the Vikings are one of the teams that could take Mixon there. And the Vikings need a top-to-down rebuild on that offense. They need an identity because you know, you watch the Vikings. What is their identity on offense? What type of team are they? Because I don't see anything that they can really hang their hat on. Adding a guy like Joe Mixon would give them that, and and maybe they don't. They could very easily go with a guy like Pat Elfline, the offensive line from Ohio State, who could put, be a plug and play starter, a right guard right away, and maybe down the line ultimately replace Joe Berger at center. Uh, they could go with a Taylor Moten from Western Michigan, a Jory Johnson from Pittsburgh. There's no shortage of options, whether it's round two, round three. If they want to bring in an interior blocker, there's going to be a good player on the board, but. Uh, but I, I just look at the Vikings. What the, could they do to make the most dramatic impact right away? And, and I think Joe Mixon is a clear answer to that question. Well, and uh, here's my deal, and I've said this for years. Talent trumps a lot, and you just mentioned it. And when it comes down to the NFL, there's not a league out there that has you know more situations of domestic violence. I mean, uh, Leonard Little killed a guy while drunk drunk driving and then still got paid by the Rams. Dante Stallworth hit and run and killed a guy in Miami. I mean there's there has been numerous Michael Vick, who I wish would, you know, just be beat to a pulp. He's a, you know, he ended up playing again and fans I, it's a sad and I you know I'm not I'm not promoting anything here but all I'm saying is fans have a very quick uh, you know tendency to forget things and when it comes to Joe Mixon you put him in the backfield and all of a sudden he's running around being you know the next Gale Sayers and people are going to forget about what he's done. It's just human nature, and especially... Look at Tyreek Hill from last year. Oh, my God. And, and then, you know what? That's kind of the same situation. And here's the, a, a better example of talent trumps everything. Ray Rice, you know, with the whole elevator situation, the only reason Ray Rice did not get picked up again is because he didn't have the talent to offset that video. That's it. 
And yep. so I'm I, as much as people want to bash on Joe Mixon. Granted, yes, he, you're not supposed to punch women in the face. We all understand that. He was 19 years old or 18, whatever it was. He's a young kid. You make mistakes. I'll never say it's you know good to sh punch a woman in the face, but. You know, the kids do grow. They do learn from mistakes. If they were to get Joe Mixon in the second round, even with signing Latavius Murray, who, by the way, is only signed, you know, for this year for the most part. They can t cut ties with them after next yep. year and, and really not lose anything. They need so, to draft a running back. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, with that said, and I'm looking at your rankings right here. I mean, when you got... The guard. You know, I, just, I just want to say one more thing about Joe Mixon quickly. Please. Is, 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 and the one thing that might work in his favor a little bit in the draft is the incident, like you mentioned, was a couple years in the past. So he's been one. There was one little thing a few months ago where he got in a little verbal argument with uh, with a, I think uh, a campus cop or something about a parking ticket. But but by and large, he's been pretty clean the last couple of years. And 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 it's not like you you mentioned earlier in the show about Laramie Tunsil how that video came out 15 minutes before the draft. And, and I think if that had happened two weeks before the draft, tons of probably wouldn't have fallen very far. It's just the timing of it was so bad. Teams didn't have uh, have the the time and resources to, to go back and investigate and get comfortable with the situation and gather information. That's not the case with Joe Mixon. Teams, Any team that has interest in Joe Mixon, they're going to have every single letter, every T is going to be crossed, every I is going to be dotted. So they're going to be comfortable making whatever decision they're making one way or the other. Four and a half minutes left on Church v. Skins. Uh, joining me is Scott Wright, President and CEO of DraftCountdown.com. Uh, so as, let's just say they take Mixon. In the second round, he falls to us uh, uh, because I'm, I'm with you. I think he could go actually before 48. But if they took Mixon at 48, obviously, in my opinion, and you tell me if you, you agree or not, I think, obviously, the guard... The D tackle and a safety to put next to Harrison Smith are my three biggest needs for the Vikings. Do you agree with that, or would you go a different route? Well, I mean, we've been saying they need a safety to team with Harrison Smith for how many years now? Uh, yeah. It's getting to the point where you just wonder: is that a position they're never going to address? Do they just not? Uh, and there's other teams like that too. The, the New York Giants with linebacker. It seems like every year we give them a linebacker early in the draft. And, they just don't prioritize that on draft day with their premium pick. So uh, the only position from the Vikings perspective, I guess I'd add to the mix there, is linebacker is maybe, um, at the very least, they need to replenish the depth with the uh, retirement of Chad Greenway. And, and I think they could probably bring somebody in to compete for that starting job uh, alongside Anthony Barr and Eric Kendricks. So, so, yeah, I think they have a pretty clearly top four. Uh, you want that interior blocker. You, want, you need a safety. You need a linebacker. You need a running back. I, I think that's the favorite to be the first four picks in some order. And, and that's the thing about the draft, too. A lot of times, you can look at the rosters and you can figure out what positions the teams are going to address. But the key is finding what order they're going to address them in. And I think that's what teams do. They have to kind of look at the big picture and say, okay, if we take Joe Mixon in round two, what's going to be available for us in round three? Whereas maybe we take a blocker in round two, then is there going to be a running back we like in round three? So there's a whole lot of moving parts in this, especially when you talk about multiple picks and uh, the Vikings are set up pretty good, though. I think they're going to be able to address all of those needs they have, uh, especially running back in the interior offensive line. Both positions are very strong. They'll have no trouble getting a starting caliber player at guard or running back, whether it's a second round, third round, fourth round. The running back position, we had 100 underclassmen come out. I believe 19 of them were running backs. So almost 20% of this underclassmen class was running backs alone. So um, it really a really a deep class, and, um, and, and when it comes to blockers, uh, if I were the Vikings, I'd be looking at taking at least a couple, honestly. I, I'd want to bring a couple seconds. of blockers and give myself options after the way that uh, their issues up front kind of torpedoed their season a year ago. Well, I tell you what, uh, I, I agree. I think offensive line, once again, is wildly important, and uh, you might have a starting five in place, but as we saw with the Vikings last year, you need uh, you need depth. And, uh, you know, it, last year was uh, possibly an aberration, you know, with all of – uh, the injury is in eight different starting, you know, offensive line groups in 16 games, which is just uh, mind blowing. Uh, but uh, we'll see. 60 they minutes. Is... Calculations in the draft last year too, with that offensive line. I mean, they took Willie Beavers in the third round, who, or excuse me, I think the fourth round, who's a talented guy, but he was not ready to play. Even going back a few years, T.J. Clemens, I really liked that pick. I thought he had a lot of talent, but he was not ready to play, and he got thrown into the mix before he was ready, and. And, and, and it wound up not working out. So 
Um, you know, the Vikings the past two, three years, they've made some missteps on that offensive line with the way they've uh, not necessarily even drafted, but the way they've developed players. So I think that's something they need to be careful with. Uh, I think if they had taken a more ready blocker that they could have plugged in and played last year in the fourth round instead of Willie Beavers, the, the season might have had a little bit of a different outcome. So uh, I think that's something they, they may have got a little overindulgent with a, a couple of picks last year. They took Ten seconds. The, the oh, hey, Scott. In the sixth round. I thought that was a bit I, of a reach. I, I'm so sorry. I, like five seconds left on the show. <laughs> anyway. No worries. We'll talk soon. Thank you so much. Uh, Scott Wright, DraftCountdown.com. Uh, you have an awesome, awesome day, and uh, we'll chat soon. Thanks so much, bud. All right, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. <laughs> I think, actually, the show is over. Anybody listening on Blog Talk Radio, the show is over. I, I tried. I tried to say something with about a minute. Uh, I'm just a terrible host, obviously. You guys on Facebook Live, thank you so much. Obviously, as usual, I appreciate it greatly. Hopefully, you enjoyed that. And, uh, you know, see what the Vikes do. See what they do. Uh, but uh, should be interesting. Should be interesting. Happy Sunday fun day to you guys. Have a great day. I got a busy one myself. I need to go and get ready and all that fun stuff. So uh, thanks again. I will talk to you guys soon. Ciao.